welcome to the writer's dream. It's another chance for us to listen to an author tell us about their magical journey through writing their book, publishing their book, and marketing their book. My name is Linda Maria Frank. I'm the author of Annie Tillery Mysteries. And you can find The Writer's Dream on Facebook. Just look for The Writer's Dream. And usually we have a, a little feature about the author that we have recently interviewed. You can also find us on YouTube. Just search Linda Maria Frank and you will find over a hundred interviews with authors. Those of you who are interested in writing or reading can get some very good advice and insights into some very good books. Today's guest is Elaine Fried Lindenblatt, and she has read Stop at the Red Apple. And the Red Apple is actually a landmark, has been a landmark for many years on Route 17. So Elaine, tell us about the Red Apple. Well, as you say, Linda, and I'm delighted to be here, by the way. Um, We're delighted to have you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, this is the uh, book, rather thin these days, but no, this is a placard on the book. Um, the Red Apple was a restaurant that my family ran. My dad started it and ran for the remainder of his life, over 50 years. And we were kind of strategically located on New York Route 17, somewhat halfway between the metropolitan New York area and the Catskill Mountain Resort Mecca. In those days, yes. the middle part of the last century, uh, there was a tremendous exodus uh, all year round to the Catskill bungalows, hotels, camps, and so forth. So we were a logical rest stop, a 24-7 restaurant that never closed uh, and was always there for people when they needed a restaurant or a bathroom. Well, during those years, uh, I think that whole area, the Catskills, was pretty historic for a number of reasons, especially entertainment-wise. It was called the Borscht Belt, correct? Right. And those, those um, resorts were famous for all of the talent that they actually uh, supported. And we all came to know them, uh, uh, Edie Gourmet, and uh, just so many people, so many names that I can think of where uh, entertainers became famous. So you were on the way for that. And also, uh, I have friends who, who know about the Red Apple simply because they went there skiing. So what was it like to, to be the daughter of, um, were you involved in the business? Yes, we all were. We, we lived in a house right across the road. Since we were never closed, we were open every day of the year, 24 hours a day. We had to be on hand, and yes, we all worked there. Um, actually, my favorite chapter in the book, and the book has uh, over 80 chapters, they're vignettes, really, very short, uh, entertaining, uh, little segments that move our story along. But my favorite one is when I'm approximately six years old and um, I've gone to work with my dad for the day and um, I'm sitting there sorting candy. That was my job. And uh, we get into what happens there, uh, a little kind of confrontation with a customer. And here I was, age six. So that was... Uh, so what was the confrontation about? Pardon? What was the confrontation with the customer? Well, it was very short because the, the, the man heard the rest, rustling behind the counter and he apparently had a question. And he said very nicely, excuse me, is anyone there? <laughs> and I, I didn't answer him because I was busy sorting my candy. <laughs> uh, and then he said it a little louder, is anybody back there? And I, I, you know, I just kind of nothing. And then when he really yelled it, I got really angry and I jumped up and I yelled something that was not very nice. <laughs> uh, I actually yelled something. I had no idea what it meant. It was in Spanish. Uh, it was what two bus boys always called each other, two of <laughs> oh, our Hispanic no. bus boys. And I yelled this and the man froze and he goes, oh my God, it's a midget. <laughs> and he runs away. <laughs> a midget. Oh, that's very funny. So My dad didn't think it was so funny when he heard it, but oh, yeah. uh, he heard this whole thing. So he ran away. Was he there to pay his bill? <laughs> I doubt that. I think he just wanted, uh, at that point, he thought whoever this little crazy um, person thing is behind the counter, I better get out of here. So give me a little bit about the evolution of the, um, of the Red Apple rest stop. How did it start? Did it start very small? Uh, and how did it evolve over time from, it was what, 1950 to 1980? 
No, it started in 1931. Wow. My book begins with actually my dad coming upon it for the first time. All it was really was a, a partially built uh, structure. And actually the original, it looked much like you see there for all of its tenure, uh, the exterior of it. Of course, it changed with the, with the cars in the years. This is from 1940s, from our most recognizable postcard, uh, and it is the front cover of the book. But the outside of the book, uh, or rather the cover, uh, the, the structure looked that way. But so it started out pretty big. Um, and originally my dad, and I tell this all in the book, we go through the whole thing, he originally was renting the property from the owner, and then 10 years down the line, 1931, in 1941, he bought the whole, uh, the whole parcel outright, a total of nine acres, which was great because we usually were hard up for, uh, we were hard up for people to find a seat inside, but we were never really hard up for the limos, the buses, the private cars finding a, a parking spot. That was no problem. And then we ran it into the 1980s. Right, um, so it was and the book years. goes through the whole story. My dad passed away in 1980. Um, we held on as best we could. Things had changed drastically on Route 17, the Catskills, uh, the heyday of the hotels and the bungalows, they had kind of passed that point. Mm -hmm. um, and we did, uh, we did need to close it in late 1984. And the, the uh, same thing that happened to uh, your restaurant uh, happened to bookstores, little bookstores. The chains took over. Mm -hmm. right? People would stop, get off the throughway or whatever, and, or take the throughway. Now, back in 1931, there was no throughway, was there? I don't no. think so. The throughway was built in sections. The section that bypassed Route 17 mm -hmm. and offered an alternate to people going up to the Catskills and points north, that was built in 1955. Wow. But I, as we go through the decades of the Red Apple, uh, our heyday when we were enormously busy was 19, the late 1940s following World War II and into the 1950s. But then smack in the middle of the 1950s, we had this opening of the throughway, which initially did impact our business, our volume sure. of sales. But we were so enormously busy that we still were doing okay. Uh, and then gradually, some people came back to the old road. Uh, they missed the the services along the road. Perhaps they missed the red apple. Uh, they didn't want to pay the tolls of the throughway. They found the throughway sterile, etc. cetera. Um, and so gradually, um, we were doing fine. In fact, in 1960, when other eating places on Route 17 were closing because they really couldn't hang on, um, we put on, we did a major renovation of the building, putting on a second large room because we needed it and switching from the take a check system, because the cafeteria, it was a cafeteria inside, mm -hmm. the take a check and pay on your way out system to the Western system, whereby you get your food and you then pay the cashier before you sit down to eat. So this was an enormous improvement. We also got air conditioning, which for the workers, such as myself, was a biggie. Oh, sure, absolutely. I remember the days of no air conditioning. Yeah, it was brutal in the summertime. So um, what, what uh, motivated you to write the book, though? Why did, you, why did you write a book about it? Well, it was a unique story. And my first thought was, you know, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And then what about all the generations to come that will never know this strange and unique part of their heritage? Uh, so that was the start of it. Uh, unfortunately, I waited a long time be before, I mean, between knowing that I needed to write it and wanting to write it and getting started. But when I finally got started, I would say my first emotion was relief because I knew it was on its way. It sure. took time. It took time to get written. It took time to get published. But uh, eventually it got out there. And do you have siblings? Yes. I'm the youngest of four. Okay. Uh, and by the time I started writing it, my older brother, who was 15 years older than I, had passed away. He was 
our manager for many years, my brother Herbie, uh, and he was a fount of information. He had written, he himself was starting what was supposed to be a book. Uh, given his temperament and medical condition, I, I knew that it would never come to pass. Were you and able then, to use his notes? Pardon? Were you able to use his absolutely, notes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, in the, before we actually get to the writing in the book, in the front pages, we have just a little blurb written by him in his own handwriting that says, why would anybody want to uh, write a book about a restaurant? And he says, because this was no ordinary restaurant. That's a landmark. And that's putting it mildly. Yeah, and then I also have two sisters who are older. Okay, so you're the, you're the baby. I'm the baby. And so it falls to you. And how many grandchildren, do you have grandchildren? You yes, yes, this? let me count, let me count. I have, I have to get this right, I have five, five grandchildren. Okay. And are they interested in this project? They're little yet. I mean, the oldest one, uh, I, the oldest one is going to be 15. Uh, interested in the book? Yeah, to some, to some extent. To them, of course, it's removed a few generations. Oh, my kids, sure. my three girls, are more interested. Um, they knew the red apple, though, as children. They were children themselves yes. when it when it closed. Yeah. I actually have a chapter in the book a short chapter, they're all short chapters, written by my middle daughter when she was, uh, what was she, nine or was she 11 in there? But it's actually called A Guide to Ms. Pac-Man, and it talks about the red apple, but also vis-a-vis um, -vis how things had changed in the red apple. The pinball machine was replaced by these um, these video, whatever they're called, oh. like the Ms. Pac-Man Pac that she stood there hours and played. So that's a fun chapter, too. Sure, uh, and, and I would assume, I mean, this is really a family heritage. People are really into heritage now, Ancestry.com. People are becoming fascinated by doing their family trees and, and finding out what their DNA connections are. So a book like this, um, I think, not only is important to your family, but these kinds of books about family endeavors and family adventures uh, and, and a heritage, really, that you're leaving to your kids. These are very popular right now. Right. So what was the process of writing the book like? I mean, this is sort of a memoir, sort of a history. Um, how did you keep notes? Uh, what was your process of writing? People who watch the show oftentimes are writers or want to be writers, and they want to know how this is done. Hmm. Yeah, the notes, the, the, the physical notes were a, a challenge because I had so much mm -hmm. written on, you know, on the proverbial cuff of your hand. Yes. I mean, it was, you know, on little bits and snatches of paper. To organize it was, was mammoth. Okay, what I did do, though, I realized that I could, that, that dreaded P word, procrastinate forever. So I was very lucky to, uh, to have the sense and to find an excellent writing coach. And he was kind of my teacher. You know, I had to show up every couple of weeks with, yes. you it's know, always how to write good the to composition. Have one of them. And I myself was a high school English teacher. And, I, you know, oh my God, oh, wait, it's due, it's due. And uh, that's how I wrote it. You know, we sat at a table at Starbucks in New York City that was about this round. And, you know, and he read what I'd written. And, he, and what he did was, I mean, I already had, I had the bones of I knew at a good story. Mm -hmm. But what he did is he kind of opened my vision. Um, he enlarged upon my uh, just thought processes. Uh, and he also, he had never been to the Red Apple himself, but he got it. He knew what it was. And he was just able to do, you know, to do a lot to expand that story and, mm -hmm. and really make it saleable, uh, you know, kind of thing. Oh, why didn't I think of that? So um, that's how it got written over a period of a year and a half of actively showing up with pages. And then what would happen is when he would critique, talk about you know what his suggestions for what I had written, I'd go back and I would revise accordingly, and then I'd bring in the, the old stuff and I'd bring in the new stuff. Yeah, that's a great way to write a book. I wrote my first two books like that. I, mm. I took a course. I took a writing course, right. and so I had a mentor, and I would have to write two or three chapters and. First you had to do the outline, and then you had to do the character outline, and blah, blah, blah. And, and it was so helpful to, to organize your mind, because when you, want, when you write a book, it's, uh, you have to be organized. Uh, at least I do. I mean, some people say they just sit down and write the book, and I, I don't know how they do that. <laughs> but I'd like yeah. to know. 
You know, we'd like to believe that we just sit down, write it, it's perfect, we get it out there, and the world loves it. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, not completely, no. All right, so you had um, a person, like a mentor, right. to help you write the book. Right. And you said you had a lot of research. Did you have to go beyond what you had collected as, uh, you know, in your family? I mean, I'm sure you had the postcards and newspaper clippings and mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. material like that. Any other kinds of material that you used, research material? Yeah, I, I mean, I was, uh, uh, the years that I was actively at the Red Apple, meaning growing up before I went my own way after college, uh, that was a whole, I don't know, a 20 year type thing, but then, what happened to the next stage when I went on and became wife, mother, da da ba da bob, yeah. and I didn't live local, I mean, I visited, but I wasn't on the scene, and that's when my adult nieces and nephews came in handy because they filled in the story for me. Oh, that's great, yeah. Okay, so they're, they're a generation behind me, but you see, having a brother 15 years older, I'm kind of like in between there, okay. and so they were, they were just wonderful. I couldn't have done it without them giving me the you know, the, the, the story, the story as it, you know, what was going on? Who was there then? How did it change? It changed and yet it stayed much the same. Mm -hmm. my, my niece, um, the things she experienced uh, were much the same of what I had experienced, uh, you know, a decade or two before. Besides the, uh, it's just a little digression, but besides the man with the candy <laughs> who thought you were a midget, um, <laughs> Can you think of, like, what's your favorite or funniest story about people you met when you were, did you meet any famous people? And yeah. how were they? Who'd you meet? Who'd I meet? Well, uh, meet coming and going, uh, a lot of people. The book has in it a page of, um, it's from our night manager's um, celebrity album, call it. He would get the... Uh, the autographs of high profile people wow. on little red apple business cards. He'd bring them home to his kids. So we have a page there that I show because I do talks on the book. Mm -hmm. And when I do talks, one of the one of the PowerPoint slides I show, it's a page. And on that page, you have everybody from Eddie Cantor to uh, Rocky Graciano. You had the people um, you know, who either trained as sports figures, comics, singers, everything. Uh, yeah, some of them I did meet. Um, in one way or the other, uh, but I, I tell the story, uh, which is my favorite story, because it's because uh, it illuminates what my dad was like. Because this is basically a character character study of my dad, who was the main character. Uh, you know, when somebody came into the Red Apple, let's say that I recognized from TV or the movies, and I would get all excited. I was a teenager, say. And now I would run over and shake my dad, look, look, look. And he'd be annoyed I'm interrupting him from helping the bus boys or sorting the silverware. Um, and now I would say, look, look who just walked in. And he would reluctantly raise his head, turn, and look. And his expression would not change. <laughs> and I would go, don't you recognize him? And he would say, why does he recognize me? <laughs> And that was him. And after I tell that story, when I talk, I then show a picture of him standing at a cocktail party in the 1940s, or is it the 1950s? Uh, I think it's the 40s with Eddie Cantor, who was the, a mega performer of oh, his sure. generation. Sure. And in this photo, which I love, you have my dad standing there. His mouth is open. So, I mean, he's talking. And now the mega famous Eddie Cantor, it looks like he's hanging on every word <laughs> of the mild-mannered Reuben Freed. Uh, and, you know, the eyes, Eddie Cantor's eyes bulge out of his head. That was one of his trademarks. And, and I love this because it just shows my dad was really... Uh, kind of atypical to be running a place like the Red Apple. Well, he was comfortable in, in who he was, I guess. Very. And, and so, and that's interesting that you should mention that he is the main character of the book because this is really about a, it's a story about a restaurant, but you, uh, you put characters in it and you uh, obviously your father is right. Mostly character. my family, a lot of characters. And I, I, I think that's what makes a book sell is people fall in love with the characters. It, the story is one thing, uh, and they want to read, you know, it's interesting to read about this restaurant because it was iconic, but it's the characters that make it, make it live. So then, how did you publish? Well, I, after, you know, after uh, going through this whole process and now I had the complete book, okay, um, 
what I did was actually my writing coach knew of somebody who was a, 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 an agent in New York City, and we sent the manuscript to her, a well-known, prominent agent, and she felt it wasn't anything she could handle, so that ended. But then I went on the internet, and I looked for a publisher whereby I could just email a query to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one I came across was State University of New York Press, that SUNY uh -huh. Press. Uh -huh. And one category that it said they accepted was regional New York. I said, well, we're New York, we're regional. And I sent a query with some sample chapters and that was how it started. They became my publisher, so I was fortunate. It was the first query I sent out um, back and forth. It didn't happen quickly. It was slow. I One of my previous jobs was as a production editor for an in-house book publisher, and I knew in my heart of hearts it doesn't take this long to get a book through the process, but I had to go with, with their schedule. They were not going to bump anything to move me up. Right. Um, and so when we finally got a contract on this back and forth, um, it, was, it, it took a while because they sent the book out to readers, freelance readers who supposedly knew the, the back story here. Uh, but when we finally got a contract, it took over a year to have a bound book date, to have a finished book, and I was very antsy with that. Yeah, well, that's about how long it takes it takes anywhere from six months to a year if I self-publish, and, and by the time you go through the process. But um, one of the interesting things that you said is that you went on the internet, and most of the agents, um, one of the pieces of advice I give is if you want to write a book, go into a bookstore or a library and find a book of the genre that you want to write, and look at the acknowledgments, because oftentimes they mention their agent, and then look at the publisher. Go on the internet. All the agents have a website, and they'll have submission guidelines. So everything just about is done. If they want you to mail something, they'll tell you, but most everything is now done over the internet, which, which can speed things up uh, or not. <laughs> well, it, it was, I, I did, you know, I, as I say, I was fortunate that this was the first one I queried. And I said to myself, because I've also written fiction that I tried very hard to get published, uh -huh. going through the whole routine fiction of the, the agent, hardest. the publishers, and nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I know why, because I had a problem. I couldn't do uh, the kind of plots they wanted. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they, yeah. they, don't, they don't want uh, anything that's slow moving, especially now. So anyway, I, I knew what it would mean if I <laughs> started the whole circuit of looking. And so I just went with them, and they were very nice to deal with. Mm -hmm. I've never laid eyes on them. I mean, they're right in Albany. I must come up there and do a, you know, a, a drop in one of these days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but that, that was my decision is that I, I, I went into writing. Too, I was too old to wait to be discovered. And you're absolutely right. There is a market out there, but the market is very narrow. They, the agents especially, they want to, you know, they want to make money. That's how they make their money. They, they buy into your project and they push it. And however successful your project is, that's the money that they make. And, and there are certain things they look for. Mine is uh, uh, mystery stories for kids, and basically what they want is they want fantasy, and they want werewolves and vampires, and I don't write that stuff. <laughs> I, I simply do not write that stuff. And so, you know, you write what you love to write, and uh, so I self-published. That, that was my, my decision. Is there anything that you would like to read from the book? You don't have to, but if there's something Not really, I, it's okay. funny. I've never read uh, only once recently did I read publicly from the book because when I talk, I don't read from the book. I right, talk, I right. tell stories. Yes, I've and, come to and you people. Like that. That's what they want to hear, really. Sure. Uh, and I ask, you know, they say, well, what, what, who's, who's your audience? I said, well, I have two categories: everybody who's been to the Red Apple and everybody who's never been to the Red Apple, because for each there is a lot here. Um, you know, students mm -hmm. of popular culture, students of the food industry, if they haven't been there, what was it like that whole last, that whole middle section of the last century? And for those who have been there, of course, it's, a, it's just nostalgia. a nostalgia, overwhelming, mm -hmm. kind of fun, cherished. So I saw you do a lecture um, on the book. And so tell me about what you're doing now. Tell me, tell your, our audience where to get the book, where you do your lectures, um, whatever you want to talk about, about how you promote the book. Because writing is one thing. That's really a labor of love. 
Publishing is whatever it is, whatever, however you, whatever route you find, but the marketing is the difficult part. So mm. tell me about your marketing. Yeah, I've never had, I've been told I should get a press agent, I, and you're looking at Don't. the press agent right here. Uh, <laughs> I, I got into this, uh, before the book came out actually, three months before, uh, my local AARP chapter had me do at their, the local JCC in Rockland County, New York, a kind of pre-thing, and it was unbelievable. They had just written an article about me in, in a local paper, and so they couldn't accommodate everybody who showed up at this, uh, at what's usually 10 people at a meeting. All right, so we had that huge thing, and that was kind of a, a forerunner, and it made me think, well, gee, maybe some people are interested in my talking. Um, when I talk, um, well, the, the format basically is, yes, we have a schedule <laughs> there. <laughs> um, this is yeah, a list. It kind of spawned itself into um, a lot of people call me, and some venues I'd like to do, I call. I must tell you, Florida itself, the state of Florida, is like a hotbed of Northeast expatriates. Oh, yes. And so when I go there, because I have close family living there, but if I go maybe once or twice a year, um, the next time I'm going is January, well, for this anyway, is January of next year, and I have already five writing, uh, or rather speaking gigs lined up. Um, but, um, and isn't this the fun part? Uh, yeah, sort of, kind of, it is. Meeting it people is. and... It is, it's been wonderful. People have been wonderful. The audiences are attentive, they're engaged, they're excited. They come up to me afterwards, because uh, we set up a table with the book and with some assorted, things, you know, interesting uh, mm -hmm. paper stuff, and uh, right, um, they'll come up and they'll be all excited and they'll tell me about their bungalow colony. And then they look like, oh, you know, and then I look at them, oh, that's nice. And they don't understand that I really never heard of their bungalow because there were hundreds and hundreds of bungalows. I've also probably never been to their hotel. Um, well, we have about 20 seconds left. Ah. So is there anything that you would like to say in those 15 seconds? <laughs> well, that just that said? what you asked me initially, yes, I do speak all over. Go to the website of the book, which is www.stopattheredapple.com. You will get an enormous um, you know, uh, display of everything you don't want to hear, but it's all on there, including an ongoing schedule of where I speak, okay? And if you'd like a book, uh, Stop at the red apple at gmail.com. You can uh, contact me directly. I'd be glad to, uh, you know, send you an autographed book, however you want it. Thank you, Elaine. Okay, thanks so much, Elaine.